Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and we will read verses 7 through 13. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. I'm going to read it in the New International Version just because the language, the verbiage is a little more in our vernacular, a little more understandable, if you will, than the King James. So Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, I'll read it from the screen. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I'd like to use for a subject, speaking only a few moments this evening, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Shall we pray? Father, in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we come to your throne of grace and we hear this message to the church in, in Philadelphia and we are encouraged by it. And God, yet we feel a certain dichotomy when we hear about being a pillar in the temple of you because God, at times we vacillate. At times we are not cured as it were like concrete should be. At times we are not steady and we ask in the name of Jesus that by your word and by the teaching tonight you will help us both to understand what is going on inside of us as believers as well as giving the Holy Spirit the latitude through the cross of Christ that he needs to form us, to fashion us into the pillars that you desire us to be. We ask this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus and all of God's people said amen and amen. I had three messages on my heart today, but this morning, Pastor Brian was praying in our prayer meeting and I encourage you to come out to that every morning from Monday through Thursday at 7 in the morning, roughly to about 8, but you can come and go as you have to and, and, and your job uh, necessitates so on and so forth. But come be a part of this. It is a wonderful prayer gathering and the Lord is touching hearts and, and doing some miraculous things as well as we're giving, I believe, this church and our other campuses a certain prayer covering that is needed in these last days. Let the church say amen. But he said something of this effect and it hit me. I remember reading as I was a little boy Revelation chapter 3 and I heard these words I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God and you will go no more out and it struck me it hit me because I felt that 
Yes, I am a Christian, and yes, I'm in the temple of my God, and we're so thankful for it. But at times, I fail the Lord. And of course, as the Holy Spirit has more and more of his way in our lives, we should fail the Lord more, uh, less and less, I should say. That is God's constant working in our life. That's what we call progressive sanctification, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. But as I read this, I kind of glory in it and I say oh God someday 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 and maybe it'll be at his second coming when the full cement is cured and I'm a <laughs> temple I'm a pillar in the temple of my God but I pray that it'll be even before that and then I was today uh, visiting a dear sister of the church who just had some operation. She's at a nursing parlor just getting better. And Mike and I went. And he relayed and regaled a story when Brother Piaz was here, uh, the, the younger one, that he prophesied over uh, Mike and Selena that they were pillars in the church. And right then I said, well, i got to preach that message then. Out of the three, this is the one you get tonight. So you can thank, if there's no good, you can thank Pastor Brian and you can thank Mike. <laughs> but I believe that there are so many stories in the Old Testament. Just as I read Revelation chapter 3, really, my message is going to be out of 1 Kings chapter 7 because I believe that there are so many Old Testament stories that relate New Testament realities in such beautiful, picturesque, poetic, and storytelling form that it's almost easier to preach New Testament realities out of the Old Testament sometimes than it is to just preach the terse New Testament. And so we have a story, and I'd like uh, the brethren to put it on the screen at this time. First Kings chapter 7. Of course, I want you to keep in the forefront of your mind the message of God to the church in Philadelphia. To he, I am he that's holy. I am he that's true. I'm he that holds the keys of David, that opens and no man shuts, that shuts and no man opens. And then he goes on to say, if you stay holy and true and faithful, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God and you shall go no more out. Oh, I look forward to that day. But until that day, I want to talk about what's going on inside of you. Even as you're being cured, even as you're being set up, even as you're getting uh, more and more stable in the house of God, I want to encourage you and assure you even from time to time, if you vacillate and you fail the Lord, I want to encourage you tonight that God's not through with you yet. That he has something yet that he's doing that he's beautifying on you and he will have his way. So that at the end, when he looks at you, he says, look at that straight pillar. What if I just stayed like that for like 10 minutes? <laughs> That'd be fun. I want to see what would go on. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. I want to give you quickly a list of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. This list was given to us by our pastor at a staff meeting we had just about three weeks ago. And it's not an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty good list. In fact, it's such a good list that if he wasn't sitting in the front row tonight, I would tell you that I compiled this list. <laughs> what the Holy Spirit does in our life. Number one, he convicts of sin. Amen? The Bible says he convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Number two, he regenerates us. Technically, that's how you're saved. When you accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit literally comes in you and regenes you. Or the theological term is regenerates you. He makes you a new person in Christ Jesus. Can the church say amen? amen? Number three, he indwells the believer. The moment you accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in. And he adopts us as sons whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Number four, he teaches and reminds us. Number five, he gives spiritual gifts. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14. 
Number six, he empowers us to be witnesses. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In fact, it's one of the few verses I learned in Italian first. Ma voi recevrete potenza quando lo Spirito Santo verrà su voi e mi sarete testimoni in Gerusalemme, tutta la Giudea, Samaria, fino all'estremità della terra. Let the church say amen. That wasn't tongues, that was Italian. English by far is my first language, but that was one of the few verses I learned at my grandfather's knee in Italian first. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost cometh upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Let the church say amen. He empowers us to be witnesses. Number seven, he provides guidance. Number eight, he produces fruit in our life. Let the church say amen. We're going to hear a lot about that today. Number nine, he intercedes for us. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God for that. And number 10, he unifies believers. Hallelujah. This is what the Holy Spirit does in us. And so I want us to take one aspect of what the Holy Spirit does in us. Again, when we accept Jesus, he comes in us to live. Amen. And his basic office work in our life is to form us into the image of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at the moment you are saved, you are also sanctified. You are set apart for a holy purpose, amen? But we also believe that the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our life and conforms us into the image of Jesus slowly because we're human, but surely, hallelujah. Now, I believe he can expedite it if we just lean on the breast of the Holy Spirit and let him have his way. We can be conformed into the image of Christ in a, in a fast way. I believe that. But yet, we do believe in this kind of progressive sanctification, though you have been sanctified in Jesus, to be sure. Yet the Holy Spirit is constantly trying to get our situational settings up to our standing. And our standing or our position, friends, is always, as the book of Ephesians says, in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Our standing, because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, is that you are completely perfect. Turn to your neighbor, especially your spouse, and say, I am perfect. Yeah, you are positionally in Christ, but your neighbor knows, <laughs> especially if they're your spouse, you ain't perfect. And so the Holy Spirit's office work in your life is to take your situation and move you from your situation to your standing, which is in perfection, which is in heaven, which is in Christ Jesus, hallelujah, which is a pillar in the temple of my God, which will go no more out. Again, I was seeing if I was brave enough to wait 10 minutes in that position. Here we go. First Kings chapter 7. Put it on the board, if you will. An Old Testament story relating a New Testament reality of the sanctification, the progressive sanctification work of the Holy Spirit in yours and my life. King Solomon sent to Tyre and brought out Haram, whose mother was a widow of the tribe of Naphtali and whose father was from Tyre and a skilled craftsman in bronze, your King James will say brass, Haran was filled with wisdom, with understanding, and with knowledge to do all kinds of bronze work. He came to King Solomon and did all the work assigned to him. He cast two bronze pillars, each 18 cubits high and 12 cubits in circumference. He also made two capitals of cast bronze and sat on the top of the pillars each of the capital was five cubits high. A network of interwoven chains adorned the capitals on the top of the pillars, seven for each capital. He made pomegranates in two rows, encircling each network 
to decorate the capitals on the top of the pillars. He did the same for each capital. The capitals on the top of the pillars in the portico were in the shape of lilies, four cupids high. On the capitals of both pillars, above the bowl-shaped part next to the network, were the 200 pomegranates in rows all around. He erected the pillars in the portico of the temple. The pillar to the south he named Jachin, and the one on the north he named Boaz. The capitals on the top were in the shape of lilies, and so the work on the pillars was completed. Hallelujah. Let the church say amen. I believe this is a beautiful picture, and we'll work quickly through the points, but a beautiful picture of God's work in our life. A beautiful Old Testament story of a New Testament reality. Now on your screen, you see a Greek temple in a city in Italy called Pestium. I've been there many times, and I've seen this uh, Greek uh, temple. And it's very interesting, and I'll talk about it when I get there, but you see here the columns and the pillars are load-bearing, right? They hold up the structure. Ironically enough, in the first temple, which is what we're talking about here, the temple where God gave the directions to David and David gave to Solomon to erect this massive structure, this beautiful structure that was used for the praise and worship of God. Even as Solomon built that temple, he did not use these pillars, named Boaz and Jachin, to be load-bearing or to hold up the temple, and that will, that'll make some sense in a moment. But working down through the passage, verse 13, 1 Kings chapter 7 says this, And King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. King Solomon, my first point, fetched Hiram out of Tyre. And King Jesus, my friends, sent us and fetched the Holy Spirit. Let the church say amen. John 16, 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus speaking, it is expedient or necessary that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart... I will send him to you. After the resurrection of Jesus, he could have talked on any myriad of things, and he did talk on a few issues, but primarily and principally what he talked about was the coming Holy Spirit. Jesus said, Tarry ye in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father which ye have heard of me, for ye shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost not many days hence, or not many days from now, that would be in the, in the modern English. Jesus would tell his disciples, I want you to procure an upper room. I want you to pray. I want you to wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard of me. And of course, we have in Acts chapter 2, they were all together in one place in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, like as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 4 says, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. What am I saying? What I'm saying is that Jesus went away and he fetched or he got the Holy Spirit to come down here. He says it's expedient or necessary or important that I do this because there was one Jesus on planet Earth 2,000 years ago and after God, God's Holy Spirit came and filled that upper room in, in Acts chapter 2. Now every believer who calls Jesus Lord is filled with that same Holy Spirit. With God. For the Holy Spirit is God, let the church say amen. For we believe in one God, but that one God eternally existent in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus went out and procured for us the Holy Spirit. So King Solomon went to Tyre and got this Jewish man out of this area of Phoenicia and brought him in to make the pillars of the temple of Almighty God. 
The Holy Spirit has come, my friend, to form you and to fashion you into a pillar. The Holy Spirit has come to come where you live and make something beautiful out of you. The Hiram of heaven has come to do wonders in brass. Verse 14 says this. And he was a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass. And he, Hiram, was filled with wisdom and understanding and cunning to work with all kinds of brass. Brass and bronze are interchangeable depending on what translation you're reading. So what we have here is Solomon grabbing someone who is a master worker in brass. My dear friends, the Holy Spirit is a master worker in brass. Brass is a very interesting thing. When it's polished and shined and taken care of, it can glimmer like gold. It is beautiful. When it is taken care of correctly, when you have the right uh, solvent to put on it and you rub it down, it glimmers. It looks like gold. And when the sun hits it, it, it almost hurts your eyes. This is brass. This is bronze when it's taken care of. But when it's left to its own devices, it cankers, it turns green, in fact. If you look at the beautiful Statue of Liberty in its own way, it's beautiful, but it's cankered brass. It's green, it's turned, it's turned what would be, if it was in your house, ugly. It's kind of beautiful over and against the, the beautiful ocean there, the Atlantic Ocean. But my goodness, that wouldn't look pretty in your house as... The brass turns and cankers. So it is with us as human beings. When we're in the presence of God, when, and that's why I encourage you to come out to prayer meeting. When you just sit even, benefit of sitting for an hour in the presence of God, it just makes you a nice guy, huh? Huh? Someone come, come in to talk to me after I've just been bathing in God's presence for an hour. I'm going to be nice to you. Amen. <laughs> but after the day has worn on and I haven't been in prayer and I just turn my toe over my couch and you come to my door trying to sell me something, I might be like, what do you want? Why? Because we're brass. That's why. We're brass, and if we don't stay in the presence of God, if we don't stay in prayer, if we don't stay in the house of God, we turn ugly, we turn cankerous, and we turn green, like the witch from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but thanks be to God, even though we're brass, we have a Hiram from heaven. His name's the Holy Spirit, who's a master worker in brass. Aren't you glad that God already knows who you are? Aren't you glad that God already knows where you need polished? And he has dispatched from Tyre this Hiram, who's a master worker in brass. Jesus has dispatched from heaven the Holy Spirit who's a master worker in bronze. He's going to polish me. He's going to make me beautiful. Hallelujah. He's going to put the right solvents on me. Turn to your neighbor and say, dial soap. Amen. <laughs> Antibacterial, praise the Lord. He's going to shine me up and make me beautiful, which brings me to my next point. Point number three. Let's go, let's go to actually verses 17 through, I'm going to invert my points. I'm going to do four as three and three as four to verse 17 through 22 real quick. Listen to this. In the nets of checker work, and the wreaths of chain work for the capitors were upon the top of the pillars, seven for the one capitor and seven for the other capitor. And he made of the pillars in two rows and one on the network, 
the cover of the capitals that were upon the top with pomegranates. And he did for the other capitor as well. And the capitor that were upon the top of the pillars, there was all sorts of lily work in the porch for cupids. And the capitors upon the two pillars had pomegranates also above, over against the belly, which was by the network, and the pomegranates were 200 in rows round about upon the other capitor. I could go on and on. What am I saying? What I'm saying is Hiram from heaven came and made these beautiful bronze pillars because he's a master worker in bronze. And he took time to beautify these things in an unbelievable way. Now, this is something, as you read your Old Testament, you would just fly by. I do too. We just read this happened and this happened and lattice work here and he made pomegranates, blah, 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 blah. What does that have to do? What it has to do with every word in the Bible is precious, amen? Every story in the Bible has meaning. And this Hiram from heaven, he is a type of of the Holy Spirit, and you are a type of brass, and he's come, the Holy Spirit has come to make you beautiful. And God's Holy Spirit has taken time with you to make a whole lattice network on the top of your capitals, or capitals as it reads in the NIV, the top of those pillars, and puts all sorts of finite lattice work, and then carves out in a row 200 pomegranates. I mean, took time. 200, and then another row of 200, and then on the other one, 200, and then another row of 200. He's forming and fashioning us. I want to encourage you tonight, if you feel undone, if you feel when you hear the words that John spoke to the church in Philadelphia, I will make you a temple, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God and you will go no more out and you kind of feel wanting, if you will, at those words of John, I want to encourage you tonight, stick in there. Hiram from heaven, the Holy Spirit is still working on you. There's an old Sunday school that says, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. And so it is true that Hiram is working on my pomegranates. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's working on that lattice work on the top of my capiter and getting it just right. Let the church say amen. Yes. He is making me beautiful. Let my wife say amen. Hey. <laughs> these pillars are for beautiful ornamentation God wants us to be beautiful ornamentation Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath ordained that we should walk in them he is making you more and more beautiful. Yeah, you might not get there overnight. And cement isn't cured overnight. But cement will cure even if, it, even if rain gets on it. Hallelujah. It's just setting up. It's just setting up. Let's see if I have enough, uh, uh, enough bravery to do it now. No, I don't. No, I don't. Hallelujah. This is what Hiram has been dispatched to do in your life. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. He's making you beautiful. Let the church say amen. amen. Verse number 21, the first part of it, 21a. And he set up in the pillars, he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple. Again, I said it in the beginning of my message as we looked at that Greek temple in Pestum. And I said, what was John thinking when Christ gave him this words through the angel to tell to the church in Philadelphia in the third chapter of the book of Revelation, this saith he who's holy and true, who holds the keys of David, who opens no man's shots, who shuts no man opens. If you stay true, man, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God and you shall go no more out. Oh, was he thinking of those 
temples in Philadelphia, of which there was one to uh, Dionysus, of which there was one to um, uh, Aphrodite. There was uh, at least, I think, four more in that city, and they were all built in this kind of Greek Doric type architecture. Was it those type of pillars that held up, or was he looking past even the second temple and looking all the way to the first temple, and I believe he was. He looks to that first temple where Solomon constructs a house for God, and he sees those two pillars. And the Bible says that they didn't hold up any weight. They were not load-bearing which tells me that God doesn't need any one of us. He doesn't need you, and he doesn't need me. Now I should just dismiss and we'd all go home and cry, huh? But he chooses to have us. He chooses to incorporate us. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to incorporate us and he wants us as a sign and a wonder out in front of the church house, out in front of the temple to say this is what God can do to an old piece of brass. This is what God can do to an old cankered green piece of bronze. He can beautify it. He can put pomegranates all over the catheters, hallelujah. He can put lily work and chain work all over it and make it look gorgeous. Yes, it doesn't hold up the temple. But thanks be to God, it sits in front of the temple as a sign and a wonder of the goodness of God. Finally, let's go back to Revelation chapter 3. We don't have to read it. I can quote it and we will conclude. But verse 21, same verse. Let's read it one more time, but the entirety of the verse here in 1 Kings 7. Then we will finish in Revelation 3. 1 Kings 7 verse 21. Then, then and he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple. And he set up the right pillar. And he named the pillar Jacob. And he set up the left pillar. And he called the name of it Boaz. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will make you, Revelation chapter 3, a pillar in the temple of my God. And you will go no more out. Hiram came and he named the two pillars that sat out in front of the temple. Named one of them, Jacob. And you know what Jacob means in the Hebrew? It means he will establish. Hallelujah. I'm about to dance right now. Hallelujah. And then he names the other one Boaz. You know what that means in Hebrew? It means he will strengthen. Hallelujah. John says to the church in Philadelphia, I will make you a pillar. I'll make you a column in the temple of my God. You will go no more out. You'll be settled. You'll be pretty. You'll be beautiful. You'll set out in front of the temple. You'll be a sign and a wonder of what God can do in the life of old nasty cankerous brass. The Holy Spirit will have formed and fashioned in you pomegranates and lilies and all kinds of beautiful fruit, fruits of the Spirit, kindness, gentleness, self-control, goodness. Let the church say amen. This is the Holy Spirit's office work in your life, and he's doing it now. So that God will say of you, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. And if for whatever reason 
You feel a little shy because you feel wayward. You feel at times you move when you shouldn't. You feel at times you kind of move this way and this way and that way and fail. The Lord, I want you to know this. That he's placed you indeed as pillars in the temple of his God. He's placed you absolutely as a pillar in his temple. And he says to you today, my friends, your name is Jacob. Hallelujah. He will establish. Oh, I might not be fully established yet, but I'm going to be established in him. And he calls you Boaz. He will strengthen. Hallelujah. You might not be fully strong yet, but hang in there, my dear brother and sister. Hang in there because the Holy Spirit from heaven, Hiram from heaven, Hiram from heaven, the Holy Ghost has been dispatched to work on you. And praise be to God. There's coming a day where he will set you up. You will be Boaz. He has established. You will be Jacob. He has strengthened. And you will be set of by God. I will make you a temple, a pillar in the temple of my God. And you will go no more out. Let the church say amen. Let's all stand if we would. I want to encourage you tonight. The devil's a liar. And at times we shouldn't, of course we shouldn't. But at times we fail the Lord. That's why the book of John, one of the books of John says, if you say you have no sin, you make God out to be a liar. But if we have sinned, we have an advocate with the Father. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we might have to do that a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times, but I want you to know the devil's a liar and God ain't done with you yet. He doesn't throw you away when you mess up. No, he tells you to repent, to ask him to forgive those sins, and the Bible says he's faithful and he's just to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and keep on working with you, keep on polishing your brass, Keep on making those pomegranates and rows up above your head, making you beautiful, conforming you, in other words, the Holy Spirit does, into the image of Jesus Christ. Taking your situation and pulling you up to your standing, which is in heavenly places, with Christ Jesus. You remind the devil that every time he tells you you ain't saved because you messed up. Tell him, no, 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 no. I'm sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And currently, Hiram's working on my pomegranates. Let the church say amen. Hallelujah. Well, at this time, I would count it an honor and a joy to pray for you if you just feel like I need more steadiness in my life. I want to be that pillar that's set up in the temple of my God that goes no more out. I want Hiram, God's Holy Spirit, to keep working on me to make me more and more beautiful. If that's you and you desire prayer tonight, as my dear brother plays, can you play and sing that song, Hallelujah, that you did with the guitar before? What key did you do it in? G? G's fine, yeah. Praise the Lord. As he plays and we sing, I want to invite you to come and I want to invite the pastoral staff and team. We would, we would count it an honor and a joy just to pray with you for your strengthening, for your beautification that God is doing even now in Jesus' name.